Well, it is seven o'clock and we will begin. Um, we were, uh, Marvin tells us we've been live. Okay, uh, wonderful. Greetings, friends, and welcome to the third annual spring lecture brought to you by the Initiative for Incarnational Ethics at McCormick Theological Seminary. The Initiative for Incarnational Ethics was started in the fall of 2018 as a project of theological ethics to communicate a project of Christian ethics that is grounded in social justice and embodied encounters. The work of the initiative was inspired by the vision of the late Glenn Stassen, Glenn Harold Stassen, my dearly beloved mentor, the ethicist for peace, justice, and the way of Jesus. Glenn was a churchman, activist, scholar, and all three were of equal importance to him. The initiative is modeled after a project that he described as incarnational discipleship. He articulated it in his final book, um, A Thicker Jesus. Here at McCormick, the initiative for incarnational ethics has a bridge making function connecting the local church and the academy with programming geared towards bringing pastors and professors together for dialogue about matters of faith. It has an inward function in the spring in dialogue specifically of, with the practice of theological education as it pertains to the manner by which we are shaping students for their vocation as leaders within the church and society. And you might think that the initiative was put together just this year based on this book, but Dr. Jennings' book is timely in light of our initiative. Professor Willie James Jennings is this year's spring lecturer. He is associate professor of Systema systematic theology and Africana studies at Yale Divinity School, a position he has held since arriving there in 2015. He is previously associate professor of theology and black church studies at Duke University Divinity School from 1993 until his move to Yale in 2015, a total of 22 years. For 12 of those years, Dr. Jennings served as associate dean for academic programs at the Divinity School. He is the author of The Christian Imagination, Theology and the Origins of Race, Yale 2010, which won the American Academy of Religion Award for Excellence in the Study of Religion in constructive reflective category the year in the re constructive reflective category the year that it appeared after it appeared. And in 2015, he won the Graymeyer, the book won Graymeyer Award in Religion, which is the largest prize for a theological work in North America. Inglewood Review of Books called that book a theological masterpiece. He's authored a commentary also a commentary on the book of Acts titled a commentary, Acts, a commentary, the revolution of the intimate for the belief net series by Westminster John Knox that our own professor Anna Case Winter has contributed to. Dr. Jennings commentary received the reference book of the year award from the Academy of Parish Clergy in 2018, but his most recent book, it is his most recent book that brings us together today. Dr. Jennings recently published a book with Erdman's titled After Whiteness, An Education in Belonging. And it examines the problems of theological education within, Western, within the Western Academy. And given the state of our nation and institutions of higher learning in the wake of the past four years, this book is as timely as it is prophetic. I should mention that Professor Jennings is now working on a major monograph provisionally entitled Unfolding the World, Recasting a Christian Doctrine of Creation, in addition to finishing a book of poetry entitled The Time of Passion. He is multi-talented. Uh, Dr. Jennings is a groundbreaking scholar, international renown, and although I did not have the privilege personally of sitting in his classroom as a student, I've studied his genius and been mentored by him for nearly 15 years now. During that time period, he has become a very dear friend in addition to an important influence in my life and the life of my family. I am deeply indebted to you for this time together, dear brother. 
I, I want to say that um, if you have a question, uh, Valerie, did we say that we wanted the questions in the chat or in the Q and A box? Um, yes, can you, yes, can they put the uh, questions in the chat box? Uh, they can put them in either or the Q and A or the chat box. I'm monitoring them both. Okay, great. We will have some time at the end of Dr. Jennings' lecture for Q and A with those of you who are listening. Without further ado, you didn't come to listen to me. Um, thank you for being with us this evening, Dr. Jennings. Dr. Williams, thank you so much for that very generous introduction. It is um, a joy always to be in your presence, my dear brother. And I am thankful for your scholarly witness and your Christian witness in the academy at this, this very urgent time. What a joy for me to be here with you all uh, this evening. I do look forward to the day when I can come to Chicago, the, that beautiful, magnificent city, and be there at McCormick in person, sharing a meal with you and the wonderful faculty there. I want to thank the faculty who hosted me for lunch conversation. It was a joy to be with the faculty at that time. I bring you warmest greetings, my friends, from Dean Gregory Sterling, the Dean of Yale Divinity School, the faculty, of Yale Divinity School, the staff, and the students. They would want me to offer warm greetings and I do so on their behalf with the joy that we share in an important work at an important time. I am so thrilled to be this year's Incarnational Ethics Lecturer. This evening, my friends, I would like to invite us to reflect together on what it means to educate at this crucial moment in history, especially for those of us involved in theological education. Education is about building. And this evening, I want us to think about building both as both noun and verb, noun and verb. As noun, it draws our attention to educational institutions and institutional life, and as verb, our attention is drawn to educational aspirations, the place of dreaming and hoping. The building we inhabit in Western education is one that is flawed. And I think that we have reached a moment in the history of the Western world where we can face more clearly, more precisely, the flaws we have entered when we can assess more clearly the malady that plagues Western education and in our world, theological education as well. As Dr. Williams was saying in my recent book, After Whiteness and Education and Belonging, I named that malady and the flaws that flow from it. The central argument, my friends, of After Whiteness is that Western education is plagued by a problem of formation, a problem of formation that affects everything we do in our educational endeavors. There is an overarching image of formation, an image of the educated state, what one looks like and acts like when one is educated. And that image is of a white, self-sufficient man who embodies three what I call demonic virtues, possession, control, and mastery. That image haunts Western education, bringing a tormenting spirit that presses, pressures, and pulls us to form ourselves into this white, self-sufficient man. I have experienced and watched that haunting in my many years in higher education as an academic dean, faculty member, and student, and in my many years as a consultant to schools across the country and in Canada around a whole host of matters, from diversity training to doctoral student formation, from curricular development to even conflict management. I have listened carefully as faculty, administrators, and staff, and students shared with me their anguish mixed with their joy. 
Their anger and frustration mixed with their determination, their doubting mixed with their commitment and our shared inability to capture in words something that we all sense haunted the educational institutions we inhabited. Yet I believe there is an alternative image that is available to us for the work of building. It is an image that we have ignored and banished beyond the work and walls of the academy. That alternative image, that alternative overarching image of who and how one should be as an educated person turns our attention to Jesus and the crowd, that motley, unruly mass of people who are together only because of Jesus. Jesus gathers a crowd. The crowd, let's be clear, the crowd is not Christian, but it is the basis on which a Christian could form. And it is the basis on which life together, rich life together could form. Another way to say this, it is the basis on which communion could form. Not just community, but deep and abiding communion. I'll explain what I mean by communion toward the end of my lecture, but this alternative image of formation is cultivating the ability and disposition to gather people together. People who would never imagine themselves being together, but here they are together because of you. Whether you are aiming to become a minister or a doctor or a nurse or an architect or a pharmacist, what you announce by the way you do your work <clears throat> is not a white self-sufficient masculinist presence that always tries to, tries to exhibit possession, control and mastery, but someone who facilitates the gathering. People coming to know one another as they come to know you. Now, how do we uncouple ourselves from that damaging overarching image of formation and connect ourselves to this life-giving image requires all of us, students, teachers, administrators, to rethink our life in the academy, a radical rethinking of our life in the academy and see clearly the struggle that we are all in the midst of. That is the struggle over and fight with the image of the white self-sufficient man, or more precisely, the struggle over white self-sufficient masculinist intellectual form. Now, before I go any further, I need to say something about whiteness. Because for some people to even say the word whiteness already borders on hate speech. But to speak of whiteness is to speak of a historical process of identity reconstruction. Whiteness is not phenotype, not first appearance, not biology, not culture, and certainly not a part of God's creation. Whiteness is a way of seeing the world, a way of being in the world, and a way of being in the world at the same time. Whiteness is a way of organizing the world, or, or making sense of the world, and whiteness is having the power to order one's world by that effort. Whiteness is an engine of aspiration. So when we say a white self-sufficient man, we are not talking about some particular guy of the past or the present, but an invitation offered to everyone, male or female or non-gender binary person of every ethnicity offered to every 
class or social status or nationality, anyone and everyone touched by Western education. It is an invitation to become someone significant by learning to see like the master, to see like the master. You see, my friends, it was the master's dream, the modern colonialist master's dream that gave birth to this tragic white self-sufficient masculinist image. Self-sufficiency, self-sufficiency has to do with the legacy of the magnanimous man, the man who inspired by the logic of stoicism lived a balanced life, never giving to the extremes of gluttony, lust, anger, or emotion. He is one who never apologizes for his strength and his decisiveness, but always uses his power for the good. He is one who makes no excuses for weakness. It is this sense of self-sufficiency that shows up throughout the colonial world in the incomidas or the haciendas, but especially the plantations of the new world. The most important person on the plantation was the master owner. He was the racial paterfamilias, as I call it the racial paterfamilias. Paterfamilias is a Greek term that refers to the elder father figure who in ancient Hellenistic societies was in charge of the household and organized it according to his life, his desires, and his dream. On the plantations of the colonial world, the father master looked out on his world and asked one crucial question, one crucial question. Who will care for my colonial holdings and my legacy after I am gone? He then looked at his sons with that same question in mind and added a layer to it. Who must my sons become? Who must my sons become in order to carry forward my holdings and my legacy and even expand them? His answer, they must become self-sufficient men who embody the three virtues I mentioned earlier, possession, control, and mastery. So between the desire of the father master and the aspirations of the master's sons, educational institutions formed and institutions formed. You see, the colonial masters formed education in the new worlds and refashioned education in the old worlds of Europe to answer that question. Modern Western education was formed in plantation desire the desire of the masters to form their sons to handle power. Indeed, many masters, as we know historically, many masters donated the lands and resources that made possible many educational institutions. Many schools exist in the Western world on the land of former plantations. Many schools came to be through the generous donations. <laughs> called the Erebon, the, the down payment that the masters made for the future of their sons. Theological education was central to this desire, caught between the desires of old masters and the aspirations of young would-be masters. Theological education focused its curricular imagination and its teaching energies toward forming elite faith instructors and faith instructors of the elite who could confirm that there were indeed men ready to handle power because each one of them possessed the knowledge necessary to address any task, known or unknown, control their own emotions and passions and knew how to keep control of those under their charge 
and had mastered the skills necessary to do those tasks that would translate into continued mastery of their environments and especially the colonial holdings of their fathers and grandfathers. These were men formed to enact their power without apology or pride for the common good. Even as societies shifted away from legal slavery and unabashed plantation life, the structural reality, my friends, the structural reality of Western education remained not only intact, but translatable and translated into every colonial site, embedding itself deeply into the institutional subconscious of the academy, especially the theological academy. So the legacy of dreaming men, the legacy of dreaming men who attain power and can handle power becomes so compelling and intoxicating for educational institutions and educators. It becomes the inner logic of leadership development. And like drug addicts, who all whose ways of being in the world have been contorted by the desire for the drug, our ways of being in educational institutions have been contorted by the desire to exhibit the control, possession, and mastery of this man. We cannot train people into it unless we ourselves perform it. Now, how do we begin to overcome this legacy? How do we begin to turn away from this image? The remaining time of my, this lecture, I want to think about the dismantling. I want to think about the dismantling. Not of the master's house, with apologies to the great Andre Lord, but of the master himself. And specifically, the dismantling of his dream and of the process by which he places us in his own aspirations for power, placing us inside his own aspirations for power. A poem for us, a poem for us. Please, please fear poor men who are smart. Be terrified of bright women who were raised in lack. These people are dangerous inside thinking walls where they feel the power of thought that can make them past less and thoughtfully thoughtless. Free now to rationalize their hungers, they are fit for making walls, destroying doors for all who might take their gain and return them poor. Their only hope now, that broken window with its constant sunlight and invading cold air, keeping the room outside so everyone can see their breathing. The dismantling begins with us in challenging the designs of the master. As I mentioned in the book, there are three designs we need to focus on in our shared work. The design for attention, the design for affection, and the design for resistance. We are living and working inside someone else's design of these designs in Western education. Now, it is not necessarily a bad thing to live in someone else's design unless the design harms us and also as part of the design conceals the way it harms us. The formation toward being the white self-sufficient man harms us 
by how it designs the cultivation of attention, affection, and resistance. To become a student or a scholar is to learn how to pay attention and to deepen one's ability to pay attention. Paying attention, my friends, paying attention is the heart of everything. But something tragic happened to attention in the long centuries of modern colonialism. Attention was forced into an embrace it did not want. An embrace that turned our attention to Europe as the center of all evaluation and drew us into a strangling and suffocating Eurocentric vision of what is serious what is rigorous and what is scholarly. These are not bad words. These are not bad words. They are in fact, good words, serious, rigorous, scholarly. They are metaphors for paying attention. <laughs> yet a Euro Eurocentric vision denied and yet denies a broad, beautiful framing of what is serious, rigorous, and scholarly, one that expands what and how we see the world. Attention, as so many of us have been formed to understand it, practice it, and embody it, must be taken apart, my friends, broken down into its basic elements. Let's think about those elements in, in this way. The attention we had the attention we want, the attention we need, the attention we had, the attention we want, and the attention we need. The intention we had has to do with the curiosity, oh, blessed curiosity. The curiosity we have about the world and the ways in which the academy disciplines that curiosity, inviting us to see some things and ignore other things. See some people and ignore others. Each of us, each of us, faculty, staff, students, each of us needs to retrace the process of the disciplining of our curiosity. The attention we want has to do with what James Scott calls the hidden transcripts we learn in order to be seen and heard, in order to be seen and heard. This is the ways disciplined curiosity intertwines with disciplined language in speaking and writing, and all aimed at showing ourselves, all aimed at showing ourselves to be those worthy of being taken seriously. Discipline language is the way to be taken seriously. Another poem for us, another poem for us. Doctoral seminar. Time for a hearing, your honor. Nervous energy quivering until the room levitates downward with doctoral students lost in running a tight circle underground faster and faster. I will ask a question. Will I sound intelligent? Like I belong to the room filled with bitten apples, all staring at me with bright light. I sweat waiting for my slender opening to give the sound of thought and prove something to no one in particular until the day comes when I stop listening to fears and listen to voices, including my own. Some never hear the sound of intelligence. Each of us needs to ask ourselves, what are the cumulative effects of practicing disciplined language? What are the cumulative effects 
of practicing disciplined language. Could such practice in time dull our ability to hear those who do not practice such disciplined language? Now, let me be clear. Disciplined in this regard does not mean correct or precise language. It means acceptable language. Language that signals the same desire we had to be heard from the very beginning, the day we stepped into the academy. I have been with many students who sense that their words are only being tolerated. They sense an impatience when they speak. They feel a strange sort of distancing by their professor when they express themselves in their writings or in the classroom. What is the attention we need to do our work today? We can only get at this question if we carefully examine the attention we had and the attention we want. Then we can start to imagine together how we cultivate that wide vision of attention shared by faculty, staff, and students, a vision of attention that is joyfully surprising in what it performs. What does it perform? The ability to see together that always gathers together. The ability to see together in ways that always gather together. Cultivating affection comes with cultivating attention and cultivating affection has to do with cultivating a love of learning and a love for all the things that make for learning. Yet just like we live with a legacy of forced attention, we carry forward a colonial legacy of forced affection. Europeans took their visions of the true, the good, and the beautiful, and compelled indigenous peoples to bind them with their own native visions of life. Sometimes native peoples could reconcile colonial aesthetic vision with their own visions, weaving them together in a fruitful mixture or an uneasy alliance. But more often than, more often, those European visions slowly covered over indigenous ideas of the true, the good and the beautiful, like weeds covering flowers. That work of forcing affection happened as new colonial worlds were built on top of existing indigenous worlds and new products, new goods, and new ways of making things told indigenous peoples the world over that in order to love rightly, you must love the European and his ways first. We meet this force affection today in the ways that the true, the good, the beautiful, the noble, and the desirable continue to revolve around white bodies and white Western life in media culture and in all the arts. We also meet in the ways academics teach affection through the stories and anecdotes we tell in our classes, the ideas we canonize, the music and the art and the literature we hold up as deeply desirable as giving us the most penetrating views of existence. The goal, however, my friends, should never be to hide affections. The problem is not affections, but limited and constrained affections that tell so many students, especially students of color, that there is an order to love of learning that runs through Europe first and then expands to others. Those other voices are as icing on the cake or embroidery on a beautiful cloth. They simply embellish what is already the truth. The Western Academy tells so many peoples your ways of thinking and being are worthy of affection only to the extent that they mimic or gesture toward Western ways. I once had a colleague who believed that he had, had achieved in his classroom a focus solely on the method of self-study and therefore had formed a democratic environment where students were free to choose from a variety of methodologies for studying the subject matter. Of course, he did not realize that his students were negotiating his affections 
not first which methods were right or wrong, but which methods he liked, which writers and scholars he preferred, and for what reasons. Cultivating a wider reality of, of attention and affection does not require we suspend judgments. It means that we judge our judgments for the world that they see and the worlds they ignore. And we locate the impediments to expanding our affections, aiming ourselves and our work toward the possibility of new loves and new pleasures. It is precisely what we see and cannot see that brings me to the third design. Designing for resistance has to do with how schools cultivate with students what it means to fight injustice and oppression and all those things that limit and destroy life. And here, my friends, I must say to you quite honestly and candidly that we are failing terribly in cultivating resistance because we don't know how to invite people into a shared work, a shared work of cultivating resistance together a shared work of cultivating resistance together rather than as individualized prophetic endeavors. I don't just mean learning how to build coalitions, but how to build lives together that resist evil together and fight injustices together. Students who enter theological education, as I said in the book, <laughs> They have to practice being prophetic on us, on professors, on staff, on other students. They have to practice on us speaking truth to power, the power that they think they see and in fact, sometimes do see. But the mistake we often make is to, is to equate the prophetic with speaking critique. But the prophetic life, the prophetic life is first the listening life. The prophetic life is first the listening life where we learn to hear the word of a God who is overturning this world and its death dealing structures, a God who is building up inside a tearing down of stratagems of oppression so that even critique, even critique is being overturned inside this building up. The building up is a building toward each other, a building together. At the very beginning of this lecture, I mentioned that the goal of it all is communion. Communion is being attuned to life together in the specifics of one's concrete surroundings where one senses the call to belonging, the call to belonging issued by God and embodied in all aspects of one's living. Those of us involved in theological education, we must sense more urgently this call to belonging and allow this call to move to the center of our designs. The designs we have inherited and yet inhabit, the designs for attention, affection, and resistance are never dormant, my friends. And if left unaddressed, they will continue to exert control over what we do, that is, they are designs that yet design, parental designs that give birth to more designs. And this is what that old master wanted. The old master seeks to claim us and turn our lives toward his dreams, but we can inhabit a better dream. And so I end with a poem that's also found in the book. He blessed it and broke open his dream. One part in each hand. To those on his left, and those on his right, he said the same thing as he handed them his dream. Eat this dream and it will kill the dream that kills. 
hands trembling. They wondered which of their dreams would die and which would grow stronger. Thank you very much. I love that poem. Love that poem. Thank you so much, dear brother. We've we've got we've got about 20 minutes here and I wanted to um, interact with you um, uh, for just a moment before uh, opening up to the many questions that we have here. I won't take much time because there's a number of questions in our Q&A and in the chat that um, people have been leaving. Um, th um, your book and the subject matter is uh, very moving to me personally. And I know, I mean, from your experience as a dean and also a student in the same kind of school um, where I was formed, one of the questions that we we come to grips with when we interact with, when we come to the knowledge of the academy in this way, um, is that the forced process of imitation doesn't tell us the truth about ourselves nor anybody else that we were sitting in classroom next to. In other words, whiteness lies a lot. It's just telling us lies and it's telling us lies about ourselves. Um, to be educated um, in and by whiteness is to be alienated from yourself. I hear you saying that. It is a process of alienation. Yes. So, I mean, I have no problem with telling people that when I entered a doctoral program, I thought for sure they were just, they just let me know because they were diversifying. I didn't have, and I did not, it did not occur to me that I had a mind in that space that the process for me was just imitation and I could sound as best as I could until my mentor, Glenn, said, no, you're in here on your own merits. <laughs> and I was, <laughs> and then I was, and then I was saying this to you earlier, I was just angry at the at the people who helped me to think that about myself but one of the ways that people respond to this process when they recognize that you know that there's there's a lot of complaint about um jim crow syllabi meaning whites only syllabi yes. you know a lot of complaints about this is to enact maybe multicultural practices is the you're not are you are you suggesting here that an enactment of multicultural syllabi multicultural practices would be the move towards this community that you're asking about that you're that you're suggesting listen i'm i'm, I'm wanting to open up that gesture it's current in in all in all um, parts of the all sectors of the academy both the theology academy and the wider western academy uh, but I want to open that gesture up and, and I want to open it up in, in two fundamental ways. The first is I want to open up for faculty um, a rethinking of their affection, a rethinking of their attention. Um, it does no good if there's not a rethinking of these matters because what's being communicated to students is not really that they're touching the ground upon which education happens, on which the joy of learning happens. What's being communicated to students is that um, we live in a litigious society and I just don't want to get myself in trouble. Mm -hmm. And, you know, or, you know, I want to do things that are just, and I want you to see that I'm, that this is a just classroom. Now that's wonderful. And I, and I, I also have great respect for not wanting to be sued, but the, 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 the riches are being left, the, are being left on the floor. The riches mm -hmm. are opening up a faculty, opening up a school to an ongoing reality of expanding affection, shaping a new reality of attention in which students come in and then they realize that their attention isn't being narrowed, strangled. Their attention is actually being expanded. And what's, what's, what's the gift inside of that? Mm. Not only are they seen, but they are being seen. You, you know, 
one of the great things we know about um, good faculty, faculty that uh, wind up taking, taking a place in the student's heart and mind long after they have left the, the school, is at a crucial point, two things happen. The students saw something through what the <laughs> faculty person was doing and or normally it's and it's both the student was seen they experienced actually being seen mm. and that that takes makes a permanent mark in them when they graduate so so on, on one sense we're trying to open up the reality of what it means to um be in the crowd the crowd is the multi the crowd is the multitude the crowd is all of that and it's, a, and it's a place where people who normally would not want to be together are being together. So we want to mm. op open up the crowd, but we also want, and this comes to that first chapter about fragments, we also want faculty, staff, and students to start, start to see themselves as fragment workers, mm -hmm. working with the pieces, working with the pieces. And so when you're working with the pieces, you, you, you enter into the deep logic, the brilliant logic of quilters. As I was saying to the, your faculty colleagues earlier today, if you've ever been in a room with a, a group of genius quilters, a group of black women or Latinx women who are quilters, to be with a group of you, you see this genius happening where they're working on a piece and they look over there and they see another piece. Like, let, let me see that piece you got. And they, they give it to them. So, okay, well, you take this piece and you see how they can cut it and shape it to fit inside what, what, they're, what they're building together. And it's precisely this working with the fragments that I want to put as the context within which to talk about syllabus construction. But mm. to try to talk about syllabus construction and talk, try to talk about a multi-cultural diverse curriculum without opening up these large realities of what has to happen in faculty, staff, and students means that the riches that are at our disposal to do our work We've left on the floor. Mm -hmm. we, we, okay, mm -hmm. I'll, just, I'll add an, I'll add another chapter from Cone over there. And then, okay, I got let me give me a little Katie Cannon right here. I'll put that right there. Uh, oh, I, don't, I only have a little bit. Oh, that's enough. Okay. <laughs> the the, mm -hmm. the problem is is that the the larger reality that should shape not simply how we pick a chapter, but how we weave a world hasn't been put on the table. Amen. I could keep going, but I'm going to make somebody mad. I know it if I do. There are 18 <laughs> questions here in the Q&A and a bunch of questions here in the chat box. So, um, Dr. Parker, why don't you um, uh, jump in now and let's start uh, interacting with the, the, um, those who are watching. Sure. Um, one question comes from a participant. Uh, my experience of theological education outside of elite North American context, I work in theological education in Australia, is that it is often mediocre to incompetent white men who are put in charge of the theological education. That is, those men are not so much aiming at mastery, at least directly, but at a status quo that is maintained through their mediocrity as scholars, leaders, and critical or creative thinkers. How would you, Dr. Jennings, analyze this difference from North American context and how would you suggest responding to such, such mediocrity without desiring mastery? Uh, thank you for that question. And thank you, uh, Dr. Parker, for your leadership and, and capturing all these questions for us. Um, you know, I, I'm been, I am in conversation right now with scholars in South Africa and New Zealand and Australia. And uh, while, the, while the questioner may uh, assume that this is mediocrity, not aiming at mastery, I think many of them imagine themselves <laughs> aiming at mastery. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think they imagine themselves aiming at mediocrity. I think they imagine. But, but the, the question is incredibly important and that is um, all of Western education is haunted by this. And so part of the challenge is to, to help people see the haunting because one can become one can become deeply satisfied with that haunting, with that demonic reality. You know, I was mentioning to someone just a couple of weeks ago, you know, the, the lectionary reading 
a week or so ago was one of one of the passages was Jesus coming into um, Jesus coming to the synagogue after the after the wilderness experience, and I and I noted in the in the text that one of the first people to speak to him after he had said the spirit of the Lord is upon me blah 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 one of the first people to speak to him was a demon. <laughs> The demon spoke first. We know who you are. <laughs> but it's it's that level of comfort. The level of comfort with what is a reality of oppression that we have to recognize. And so what that means is that theological education across the planet has got to recognize that there have been demonic realities that have made themselves at home in and among us. And all of us who are Christian the gift we know we have is we can cast out the devil. Amen. His question also seems to me to uh, refer to representation uh, because what's mm -hmm. interesting is that when you add people of color into institutions that are typically white like that, the, rep the assumption is you're, you're moving towards mediocrity. Right, <laughs> that's exactly right. But, yeah. th but this, this is the challenge we're facing um, there is an evaluative logic that we have to address head on. But anyway, my sister, I don't want to eat up this time. So other questions, other questions. Who yes, you yes. You're muted. I am. I am not now. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> would, you, uh, would you mind please expounding on speaking prophetically within a theological context? This is the first time I've heard it spoken such as this, and it's captivating. Yeah, the, the, um, the reality for us is that the Theological Academy has to be a place, especially for students, where they get to practice the prophetic. <laughs> they, they, get to, they get to try out, um, in a sense, their voices, their courage. And one of, the, one of the painful realities that we just have to accept is that they have to practice on us. So they, they, have to, they have to call out what they see as injustice in our ranks. They have to call out inconsistencies. They have to call out things that they think are falling short of the lofty things that we're saying in the classroom and we put into our curriculum and have in our mission statements. The challenge is to uh, invite them to see that critique, critiquing things, critiquing structures and so forth is not the sum total of the prophetic. It, it doesn't capture the prophetic. In fact, critique itself is being overturned inside the prophetic reality that God has brought about the prophetic speaking and hearing. And now what's key to that, as I said in the lecture, this is so important. When you read um, and you see the prophetic as it is, as it is performed in the scripture, the first reality of the prophetic is not talking, it's listening. <laughs> the prophetic life is a listening life. And it's precisely the depth of one's ability to listen that enables the depths of one's ability to speak prophetically, that listening to God, but also listening to the pain and suffering for all around us, not just the pain and suffering that others can see, but the pain and suffering that's hidden the pain and suffering that's inside the those and the voices who we would prefer not to listen to what we what we always remember from the ministry of Jesus Jesus heard what others did not hear inside what people were saying to him and he invites us into this reality with him and so for so many institutions what that means is we need a different way of imagining what it means to cultivate the prophetic and not move people toward this individualized endeavor to present themselves as this courageous, heroic leader. One of the most dangerous things is to invite someone to see themselves as a prophet alone. Mm. Mm. Amen. Go ahead, my dear sister. I'm still, I'm, I'm listening. I'm <laughs> listening. Um, Dr. Jennings, I'm currently pursuing a Master of Arts uh, uh, alongside of men and soon women who are incarcerated just outside of Chicago. Amen. We take communion by dipping peanuts in water while simultaneously seeking 
physical liberation of our incarcerated brothers. Mm -hmm. Given the historical realities of the prison system and white theological institutions, what encouragement or challenge would you give to a free and incarcerated community pursuing a decolonizing and de-westernizing but embodied and liberating theological education together? Oh, that's wonderful. That's a great question. The, the, I think it's a twofold, a twofold invitation for us. The one is to um, invite ourselves more deeply into the, the call of God incarnate who says, when I was in prison, you visited me. That the, to be with our sisters and brothers who are incarcerated is to be with Jesus. And we must, we must never, we must never forget the significance of that statement. Because there, there is, that is the position from which God will judge us. God looks out from through the eyes of one incarcerated into this world to speak judgment. And mm -hmm. so what's crucial for us is to calibrate what we do by the call to communion with our sisters and brothers who are incarcerated. And what's also crucial is to join in um, the, the deepest kind of abolitionist understanding, right? And, what, and it's that, that abolitionist understanding, and here I'm just simply quoting the great Angela Davis, that abolitionist understanding is not that we want people who are incarcerated to go free. We want to end incarceration. The famous title of her book, Are Prisons Obsolete? We already have an answer to that. Yes, they are. <laughs> and we got that answer a long time ago when, when Jesus walked into the synagogue and said, I am here to set the captives free. So a, a joined project of abolition bound with a reorientation of our moral center from those who have been incarcerated. You know, as I, I, I mentioned this in the commentary on the book of Acts, um, the deepest mind of a Christian is the criminal mind. We are, we are ones who are always, when you read the book of Acts, the disciples of Jesus are always going in or coming out of prison. Our recidivism rate is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> because we are always, we are always speaking against the, uh, the weaponization of the law to destroy life. Hmm. I, uh, I actually, I think that is where, that's a good place to put a period on this evening. Um, we have come to our time. Um, we have a lot more questions and sisters and uh, <laughs> brothers, uh, dear friends, I am so sorry that we could not get to all of the questions. I, I could have backed off my own question at the end, but um, <laughs> this just speaks to how um, fruitful this moment has been. It, it engendered quite a bit of dialogue and, and quite a number of questions. Um, keep reading, read the book and let's practice engaging theological ed education differently and belonging better, differently um, and better. Um, I want to thank uh, you, Dr. Jennings, for this evening with us. Thank you, uh, Dr. Parker. Thank you, Reverend Rhonda Hoskins, for your hard work. Um, uh, Barbara Fassett um, and um, Richard Mayo uh, and to the McCormick community. Uh, for hosting this time together. Uh, we, are, we are family and we need each other and you all do excellent work. I wanna make sure that everyone is aware of our another lecture that the Incarnational, um, the Initiative for Incarnational Ethics is hosting with uh, Professor Carolyn Roberts of another Yaley, uh, Bula Bula. Um, <laughs> Carolyn, um, Dr. Carolyn Roberts of Yale University on a history of harm, historical legacies of African-American medical distrust. Mm -hmm. This is a timely, it'll, it'll happen at 3 p.m. on March the 10th. Be on the lookout for advertisement. 
to join us for this lecture as we are as we are discussing the harm of COVID-19 in black communities and the possibilities of or the prospects of this vaccine. So once again, um, thank you so very much, dear brother. My pleasure. My pleasure. Great to be with you all. All right. And my class, I'll meet you in the wonder side here in a moment. <laughs> talk to you, talk to you soon, dear brother. Thank you, oh, Dr. Okay. Jennings. Thanks, Dr. Reggie. Thank you, right. Dr. Parker, for your great work tonight.